Welcome to this week's GCN Tech Clinic, where we help solve your bike-related problems. If you've got one, leave it down there in the comment section below, and who knows, maybe I will get to tackle it in a future episode. Let's crack on, though, with the first question this week, and it comes from Martin H., who has a problem with their bar and stem. Uh, when they write down curbstones or similar drops, the bar tilts forward in the stem. They've had to stop a few times on a ride and get the tools out to fix it. They've got a pro, pro bar and an aluminium stem. They've tightened it to the correct torque using a known brand torque wrench and they still get the issue. Anything they can do about it? Right then, Martin, it's worthwhile probably measuring the uh, bar as well as the stem with some calipers because they do tend to actually maybe have slightly different tolerances. Uh, now there was in fact a brand out there who were using I think 31.7 millimeter bars instead of the common 31.8. And with older uh, type of handlebars, we used to have 25.4, 25.6, 25.2, things like that, which really did, well, basically make your life a bit of a problem with handlebar and stem interfaces. So first up, I'd do, like I say, measure those and check. Uh, failing that, I mean, like you say, you are talking up to the correct amount. You don't want to start over-talking anything because aluminium, you know, it is quite lightweight and it can even be quite fragile. So the best option would probably be to either buy a new handlebar or stem, or alternatively, get the pair from the same brand that are going to match up perfectly. Next question comes from Tez Alle, who asks, Hi John, what's the point of an inner tube valve washer? According to the rules, they should be removed. Uh, it's a great question this, because most people, they tend to just put them straight in the dustbin when fitting a new inner tube. Uh, now, I tend to actually use them on standard box section wheels, so you know a shallow section rim. The reason being, when you're pumping up one of those, with a hand pump in particular, you tend to wiggle it around a little bit and give it a little bit of extra torque because, well, if you've got pathetic puny little arms like me, uh, you don't really have much to give, so you tend to put your whole body behind it. And in turn, it stops the valve actually wriggling around inside of the valve hole, which can sometimes even rip the valve out of an inner tube and leaving you deflated. So on deep section wheels though, we tend not to see them because obviously that deeper section profile of the rim tends to support the valve stem a lot better. Uh, as for the rules, well, you don't have to stick to those. You can make your own rules. Leave them on if you like. Next up is a question from TC who has a problem with their gearing. Uh, so they use Shimano 105 and when TC is shifting towards the middle of the cassette, the chain starts to jump on the teeth of the cassette. It doesn't change gears when it happens apparently, but it's like it's slipping. Is it because the chain is too short? Right, you haven't said if it happens uh, any further than the middle of the cassette. So my first put of call would be to look at the cassette teeth, make sure that they're not sharp, so they're not looking like shark's teeth, if that makes any sense, and that they are having a nice smooth profile. And then also try and check your chain too. So the ideal thing for that is a chain checker, so you can actually measure to see if the chain is worn at all. Um, now, you could also check the derailleur hanger. Now, it's very unlikely that most home mechanics, for instance, are gonna have a derailleur alignment tool. So take it down to your local bike shop and make sure that your rear mech hanger is nice and straight. That is something that can plague a lot of bikes. Failing that, one last thing you could do is actually make sure you don't have any stiff links on your chain. So slowly rotate that chain backwards, for instance, and look to see if there is part of the chain, a couple of links or one link, which is just quite not sitting perfectly on top of the sprocket. If it is doing that, then just simply flex the chain backwards and forwards either side of that stiff link and it should free it up. Next up is a question from Jared Fontaine. Uh, so Jared has stripped his derailleur hanger. Oh no, Jared. Uh, now the rear derailleur, it will not screw in all the way and they can't get into the 28 tooth on the rear cassette. Uh, any hacks, etc., buying a new hanger or rear derailleur. Now that's quite unfortunate, Jared. I don't know how you've managed to do that, but you could try and temporarily save it. So try and thread the uh, rear derailleur onto the hanger, but from the reverse side. So essentially from the inside instead and try and see if you can cut a new thread. If you can, that's great news and you are gonna save yourself a little bit of time until your new derailleur hanger, which you are gonna go out and order, arrives. 
A little tip here, have a little look around online. I know there are a couple of websites out there that offer a humongous, huge variety of different derailleur hangers. Try and get a CNC aluminium one. It is gonna be stiffer than a cast alloy one, and in turn, you're gonna get better gear shifting. No, you are not gonna to need to buy a new rear derailleur in answer to your question too, because the actual bolt is certainly a lot tougher than the derailleur hanger itself. Next up is a question from David Fannenstyle, who asks, what type of rags do you use in your maintenance set and where do you use what? Right, so I use a few different ones. Uh, microfiber ones for drying a bike or frame and components after you've washed it. That's if I'm not using some compressed air from my compressor at home, which I just blast it off. Also, those microfiber cloths are great for applying wax onto a frame and then polishing it off to keep your bike looking nice and clean. Uh, I tend to use paper towels or newspaper to mop up any spillages. Try not to have any of those, but sometimes they do happen. And then finally, some old rags, so t-shirts, jumpers, jeans, socks, underpants, something like that to actually clean up old components, just wipe away any grease and grime. So now we've got a question, I love this one, from Barnabas Smoggy, who asks, how much weight can I save with Drillium? I have an old steel racing bike and I really want to make it lighter. Right, I'd love to give you a crazy technical answer for this one, but I'm afraid I can't because I'm not sure actually what it is you're gonna be drilling. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Drillium is an act of basically drilling holes in something to make it a little bit lighter. Uh, it was a crazy fad during the 70s and 80s with the attempt to try and lighten bicycle parts. Uh, it was very popular with time trialists in particular because they weren't putting in sudden efforts which could essentially snap any components because once you start to drill holes through cranks, brake levers, uh, pedals, rear derailleurs, chain rings, that sort of thing, Believe it or not, it does start to weaken a component. So my bit of advice for you would be to certainly not do it, and for any weight savings, yeah, you are gonna get probably quite a considerable amount, depending on how much material you remove, but you would probably lose some weight from your body too, because you could well end up losing some teeth when those parts snap, so just don't do it. Next up is a question from Michael O'Neill, who has a problem with his disc brakes. So Michael says that when he punches up climbs or sprints, he can hear the front disc brake rotor rubbing. Uh, apparently it's true, and there doesn't seem to be any other problems with it, but it does seem to be a little bit worse after a quick stop and then went up another climb in quick succession. Right, Michael, it sounds to me like you need to possibly bleed your brakes, or alternatively, have a look at the actual pistons on the caliper itself. So the bleeding of the brakes, that is gonna give you some fresh fluid in the system. So hopefully removing any air from the system, which in turn cannot give you better braking from time to time. Alternatively, the pistons themselves can become a little bit sticky inside of the caliper. Uh, one way of tackling this problem is to remove the wheel and then with something like a tire lever, for instance, hold one of the pistons hard against the caliper and then gently pump the brake lever, very carefully though, just to try and free up the piston from the actual caliper. It might make a little bit of a noise, but you don't want to do it too much because then in the worst case scenario, that piston is gonna pop from the caliper and it's gonna cover you and potentially your lovely carpet in oil. Uh, if that is the case, just try and actually do it with both sides and then clean away any grime because you are gonna get a little bit of road grime and dust and things like that from time to time, which are going going to basically not allow soft and fluid motion of the pistons. And then just give it a little bit of coating of something. I actually use a little bit of uh, dot fluid on the brakes I've got, and that tends to actually just help those pistons move in and out. Next up, we have got a bottom bracket question. Always an area of slight confusion and controversy sometimes. Uh, both Dexy and Leonardo Lemgruber both want to fit uh, the 386 style crank set into an Italian threaded bottom bracket. How can they do it? Right, this is a great question. Uh, I actually wanted to fit a 30 millimeter axle crank set into a standard threaded British bottom bracket. And I had an option out there available. But for an Italian threaded bottom bracket, which isn't that common these days, I have to say, well, 
there's not a huge variety of bottom brackets available for you. I do know that Rota, in fact, make one. Whether or not it will definitely work with a 386 Evo chain set, I'm afraid I don't know. But I reckon with some spacers, it should do the job. But then again, we all know what bottom brackets can be like. But certainly do check out that Rota unit because it could well be the one that suits your needs. Next up is a question from Matt Woodford. Why do I have to adjust my gears every time I swap my wheels uh, on my bike or put it on the direct drive turbo? The pros can swap wheels without a problem, so why can't I? The chatter from the misalignment drives me nuts. Please help. Right, Matt, there's a good chance, or a chance at least, that the over lock nut distance uh, between your wheels is slightly different, as well as on the actual direct mount turbo trainer. So if you can, try and measure that to check it out. Uh, failing that, when the chattering noise starts to happen, get off of the bike and have a look and see whereabouts the rear derailleur is uh, in comparison to the actual cassette sprocket. Too far over one way, and maybe you want to look at how tight you're doing up your quick release skewer, because if you do them up too much, the derailleur hanger has a tendency to kind of drift over a little bit with that extra pressure, and in turn, not giving you perfect changing gears. Uh, finally, Make sure that your cassette is not worn because that too could be giving you that chattering noise. Right, Adrian Wells, they've got themselves a creaky saddle. Uh, apparently it creaks when putting through power in the pedals and they've tried greasing the rails, but it hasn't made much difference. Anything else they could try. Right, a couple of other different solutions you could try there is actually to use some copper paste or some anti-seize, something like that. That solved a creaking saddle for me once. Uh, something else you could even try is some silicone spray. So where the rails actually go into the base of the saddle, give that a good blast in there and see if that eradicates the problem. Uh, also make sure, obviously, that both the seat clamp as well as your seat post clamp are both torqued up to the correct amount. Hopefully that's gonna give you creak-free riding. Final question this week comes from Jebba, who says they're considering buying a front wheel off front fork roof rack for their bike. Does this put extra stress on the forks and they're not gonna last as long? Or is it going to be better for the bike if they just keep putting it on the back of the car clamped onto the top tube? Aluminium frame and carbon fork. Great question there, and I nearly did slip up with the front wheel off front fork roof rack for my bike. Anyway, many, many years ago, this question was asked by people, especially around the first carbon bikes that were out there. I've never heard of any premature failings of a bike uh, using one of those front fork roof racks. I'm sure that someone out there will have a different story to tell, but as far as I'm aware, there are no problems or concerns to actually be worried about with that. Well, thank you very much for watching this week's GCN Tech Clinic, where we hope to answer your problems. Uh, let me know your technical questions down there in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to answer them. Remember as well to like and share this video with your friends. And if you've not subscribed, make sure you do. And also click that notification bell so that you get alerted each time we post a new video. Don't forget as well to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com where we've even got a new product for you this week and it's the Topic Mini 10 Tool which has a very neat GCN logo etched onto it. How cool is that? And now for two more great videos, how about clicking down here and down here.